Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hebrew Lutheran Church. Welcome to worship. Glad that you're here. And stand up and worship with us. That would even be better.
we do pray that your kingdom come. Your will be done. God, we welcome your kingdom and we welcome your rule and your reign. And we long for your power to be put on display for all the world to witness through us, your body, your body of Christ. We pray that next week, all of us, your bride, are able to do our job so well that as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, hearts are changed and eyes are opened and peace is known and joy is experienced. We pray that you help us be truly Christ-like so there's no question that you're among us, that you're working through us to heal the world and the nation and all that are welcome. Father, that you're thinking of this entire universe when you sent your son, infant Jesus, through a miracle, a virgin birth for all of us. We're so thankful. We humbly thank you, God. Teach us daily to be the evangelist according to your will. Let us see the role model of Jesus with a clear picture through the undistorted lens of you and not the world, not humanity. God, we pray for all our friends and our family and our loved ones right now in this moment. We pray specifically in our hearts and minds or out loud for these people who are hurting, hopeless and helpless. God, send your mercy to you and our Glenn, and Bob, and Mark, and Dan, and Jim, and Linda, and Carla, and Randall, and Debbie, and Randy, and Jesse. We ask that the bright light of Jesus surround these people, all the people now who are struggling, that your mighty healing power take away their pain and suffering. God, continue to heal all of us from the ways of the world and lead us down the road that you've planned for our lives. That includes you with every step that we make. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to ask everyone just to have a seat. Feel free to sit there quietly as you listen to the lyrics about God's creation. Meditate on the words that tell His story, starting from the beginning, when the Spirit moved in the darkness to the birth and resurrection of our Savior, God's Son.
verses 10 through 14. And the angel said to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Our God is a God of joy. At the birth of Jesus, the heavens were flung open with celebration. The joy-filled song of the angels resounded through the countryside, a song and a joy that continue to spread throughout the earth today. As followers of Jesus, we have an unshakable source of joy that our Savior came, died, rose, and will come again. We walk not in fear, but we find our strength in the joy of the Lord. Let us pray. God of joy, you minister to our hearts, filling them with delight and hope, even in the difficulties of our present season. Strengthen us and open our eyes to see you at work and to witness your good news transform this world. As we look to the child and as we look to the second coming, fill us with the joy that overflows for our community. Thank you, Hopperton Clan, and extended Hopperton Clan. <laughs> uh, it's great to be with you this morning. It's also great to have you if you're following us online. Uh, my name is Pastor Michael Stoops. I am the senior pastor here at Hebrew Lutheran Church. Um, so we are continuing today in our Advent series. We're now in the third week. You can guess that from one, two, three candles. Uh, and in this series, we've been looking at how we can't keep the biblical story kind of, you know, over here. We can't keep it at arm's length. We're a part of that story, right? We're, we're a part of it. We can't kind of get around it. We can't be separate from it. We are literally inserted into the story. And where we are, where we have been over the past few weeks, is talking about how we are between Advents. We're between the first Advent, which was the first coming of Jesus, that's where we're, you know, where, where we're celebrating. We're celebrating the coming of sweet baby Jesus, six pound, eight ounce baby Jesus. He came, and he lived, he, he did grow up, and he uh, taught, and healed, and uh, died uh, in our place for our sins, and rose from the dead, and ascended to heaven. And then we have the second advent, right? That's going to be when he returns in glory, in, in both judgment and in, in, in righteousness. And we find ourselves between those two things, those two events, the first advent and the second advent. Now, we talked two weeks ago about how um, knowing this is going to shape us in the in-between time. It's going to shape us because this is all about God's timing, not mine and not yours. God is not interested in taking his cues from us. He determined when Jesus would come the first time, and surprise, he's determined when Jesus will come again. And yet, in God's timing, we find patience, we can wait, we prepare ourselves. Now, last week, we talked about um, assurance, that when we live in this in-between time, we can have assurance. We can have that feeling of peace when we find our assurance not in our own selves, not in our own behavior, not in our own checklists or following the rules or being good Christian boys and girls, but rather we can have peace, we can have assurance when our faith and trust is in Jesus, who will never change. A Jesus who came as a baby, lived, died, rose, and ascended to heaven. When we place our trust in him, our assurance is sure. That's not going to change. Those are historical facts that shape us today. Now, today we're going to look at another way in which we are to live in this in-between time. And maybe it's kind of a different way that maybe we often think of how we live as Christians. And so we want to look at the word sent. Sent. 
I don't think we normally would say that. If someone were to ask you, hey, what's it, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And I'm not assuming all of us are followers of Jesus. So if you're not a Christian, we're, we're glad to have you with us. We're, or even if maybe you've been here a long time, you're still struggling through some things in faith, asking questions, dealing with doubts. That, that's great. That's a great. This is, the, this is the place to be for that. But most often, when someone goes, hey, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? We all go, it means I'm sent. Where? Set how? Set up? Down? Not down, not down. We know not down. Up? You know. What does that even mean? I mean? We think about things that we send in our modern day uh, and age. We think of text messages, right? Now, I'll just tell you, the last service, I was like, oh, you know, because I, I said, average person send, in America sends 94 texts a day. Didn't you think you hit about 94 texts a day? Look it over, because I think this row is going to be as close to 94 texts so that we can hit. Okay? We'll just say, I'll just, I don't think they're watching. The last service, they weren't quite sure how to text another rotary phone. Okay? So, <laughs> did, did, Robin, I think you just said that out loud. I can't believe you said that. That's so, Jesus forgive me. I love how I throw people under the bus. So, um, yeah, so look, we, we send text messages. It's a way in which we communicate and connect. Um, sometimes we also, it's a little faded here, but it's a really rough looking package, right? Right, that's what we're doing right now. We're sending packages, we're going down to the post office, we're going to UPS, we're going to FedEx. My wife has been out of town for a, a little while. She's um, uh, doing some stuff in Knoxville, and she keeps texting me like, oh, you know, this package should arrive today, this package should arrive today, and I'm glad, like, I'm like oh, I'm glad I don't have a job, because I'll just sit around waiting for the packages to arrive between sometime, never. And the funny thing about living in the parsonage right over there, by the way, I can like, look where I sleep, um, is you never know where the package is going to come. It's a surprise every time. You know, you're like, it's 3090. It says it on the flipping building. Like, it's not hard to figure this out. But it, it might end up, we, we've got packages on our steps. We've got packages on the back steps. Thigh steps. Neighbors got a package for us. We got packages at the uh, north doors over here. We've got packages at the south door. Like, y'all think I live in here? No. You just never know. But we send packages way of connecting. Sometimes we send to people, right? For some of us, for our work, we get sent to different locations. Maybe if you if you served in the military, thank you for your service, but you were probably deployed or sent different places. We send people with particular sets of skills to accomplish particular missions. Well, the interesting thing about sending is that when we see the Bible, we see a picture of a God who often sends people just the same. Right? We can even go back to the Old Testament. We have Abraham, and he's just minding his own business living in the land that his fathers had lived in for generations, and God says, you're going to leave. You're going to go from Haran, this town you live in, and you're going to take all of everything that you own, and you're going to go to the promised land. Later in the book of Exodus, you have, oh, there's, there's Abraham and some camels. And later in the book of Exodus, you have Moses, right? And, and again, you know, we've all seen Charlton Heston, or maybe you're a Prince of Egypt kind of fan, but you kind of know the story, right? Moses grows up in Egypt, kills a man, and has to flee. He's a fugitive. And he goes for decades. He's a shepherd on the side of a mountain. And God shows up at a burning bush. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know that place you were running away from for decades? You're going to go back there. And you're going to go back to Pharaoh. And you're going to leave my people out of slavery. God is sending Moses in that moment. We see that with prophets later on. God sends them. He commissions them. You're going to go bring my word to the people of God. And then when we come to the New Testament, we see Jesus. And Jesus is kind of like, he's like the ultimate missionary, right? He's the ultimate sent one. He is God who became a human being. He was sent by God. And we're going to look at the book of um, John today. And John, he repeats it so many times, you just can't mistake it. Right? I mean, I, I feel like I, I need everyone around me repeating the things so I actually remember them. And, uh, and John, he, he's like right along there. He's like, Jesus keeps saying, the Father sent me. The Father sent me. You need to know the one who sent me. The Father sent me. John wants us to understand, Jesus 
He's not just here by random coincidence. He's not just here because it kind of seemed like an okay moment to show up. Jesus was intentionally and purposefully sent by God, by the Father, to this world. To live, to die, and to rise. And, um, and so what we see in this picture from the Old Testament to Jesus, to the apostles that are sent out, um, is a God who sends people out. A God who is inviting us to be sent. Inviting us to be stretched beyond our comfort zones in our life of faith. Inviting us to maybe step into the unknown. Step into what might seem to be dangerous waters. He wants us to know that you are sent. You're sent. Again, that might not be the first way we would describe being a Christian. But the Bible says, no, you are sent. And so I want you to see this from the scriptures, and we'll talk a little bit about how this shapes who we are and how we live as followers of Jesus in the in-between. So we're going to be in John chapter 20. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open up to John chapter 20. Um, if you, you can pull out your phone, iPad, rotary phone, just dial it up. And we're going to be in John chapter 20. We're going to pick it up in verse 19. So as you're turning there or scrolling there, um, what's happened is Jesus has been crucified. He's been raised from the dead on the third day. He's appeared to Mary Magdalene. She's the very first uh, one to, to, to see his empty tomb, to realize he is risen. And he says, okay, uh, Mary, you need to head back to my disciples. Let them know I've risen from the dead. And so this is the exact same day, just a little while later, she's told the disciples that they're all locked in. And so let's see what happens. Verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. That, that would be the religious authorities, not all Jews. They, they're, the disciples were Jews. They, this is talking about the religious authorities that were seeking out Jesus and seeking out the disciples. So for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Okay, let's just set the scene here. So again, he's emphasizing, he's saying, this is the same day as his resurrection. And he, he says, okay, the disciples, they've locked the doors. They are fearful, right? Even though they maybe have even heard the news from Mary, Jesus is risen. Like, I don't know if you, if, about you, but if I heard the guy that I just watched die three days ago is risen from the dead, I want to check that out. I want to just take some, some person's word for it. And what if it's true? And some anticipation, some hope, all of that squashed. Fearful. And then what stands in our way of being sent, of sharing our faith, of sharing the love of God? Then fear. Fear that we look stupid. Fear that we say the wrong word. Fear that we, we mess up a prayer. And instead of just even trying to take a step of faith, we just go, no, no, that, that too, too fearful. Not going to do it. And like the disciples, we isolate, we lock ourselves in. And yet, even in that moment of fear, and even if, if maybe when I'm, you know, you can tell like I'm talking a little bit about sharing your faith, and you're making you, you know, you're even like, I'm getting a little nervous right now. Stoops, like, okay, that's it's okay. It, it's 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 not always something that comes naturally to all of us. We don't all have natural gift into that, and that's okay. But we don't want to stay in that fear because it's that fear that paralyzes us and doesn't help us move down the line. Anymore. And the good news is, man, Jesus steps into that moment. And so we see that um, right there. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Now, some people make a big deal here of like Jesus like walked through walls or something here. Maybe he did. He's God. He had a glorified body. He could do that. Others suggest maybe the door just kind of sprung open. Either way, the more important thing is that he has come near to them in their moment of fear. And so look, if, 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 as we talk about being sent, as we talk about sharing our faith, as we talk about sharing the good news of Jesus, if that makes you nervous, if that makes you fearful,
fearful, if that makes you anxious, if that makes you step back from the table, guess what? Jesus is there. He is not intimidated by our fear. He's not limited by our fear. But man, he comes alongside his disciples. And look how he's gonna how he's gonna give them. He's gonna he said peace be with you, but he's gonna show them that peace. Verse 20. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they, they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Now here's where we're going to camp out. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. All right? So he's shown them the nails, the nail marks, the, where the spear had been put on these. He's showing them, I'm, I am Jesus, the same one. Again, he says, peace be with you. They, they didn't say, and also with you. So he had to repeat that. He's trying to, you know, wake them up that one, that one that evening. But then he says this key word, this key verse. As the Father has sent me, even so, the, the last four words together, I am sending you. Jesus sets up this parallel statement, right, this analogy. He said, just as the Father has sent me, which he's repeated again and again and again in the Gospel of John, just as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. All right, this is the plural. This is the y'all, all y'all, you guys, you ins, I sent you. So if we're going to understand what it means for Jesus to have sent us, what does it mean to be sent in the in-between time? We need to look at how Jesus was sent. And so I want to look at two questions, hopefully briefly. I want to look at uh, where was Jesus sent, and then how was Jesus sent. And I think that's going to show us where we're supposed to be sent, where we're being sent, and then how we are to be sent. So first question, where was Jesus sent? Well, first off, he was sent far. He was sent far. He was sent from heaven to earth. That's pretty far. Now, again, we, I don't want to get into the whole metaphysics of like where is heaven and how heaven is a, a realm and you know it's not up in the clouds. You know, there's not little you know naked baby angels up there floating with Jesus or something like. That's, that's not how heaven works. But the distance between the eternal throne room of God, where you are constantly where Jesus is constantly being worshipped and served by angels to become a human being in the backwoods of Bethlehem in a manger with some straw and some lousy farm animals? That's a step down, okay? That's more than roughing it. I mean, that's, that's, a, you know, that's an infinite distance. That God would become a human being is an infinite distance. Now, Earth, in an earthly sense, he wasn't really ever sent that far, right? Most scholars and, and the Bible would tend to agree, he never really tr had to travel all that far. He traveled all around, you know, from kind of as far south as Jerusalem up to Galilee and kind of all there in between. Might have been out in the wilderness some, but, but as God, become a human being, that's a far distance. And there's times where God sends us far. Right? And I think that's sometimes the first way we think. Like when I talk about sending, we think of missionaries, right? We go, yeah, God sends some people far, and thankfully there are people that aren't making Because I like it right here. Because it's comfortable and it's nice and it's everything's like I, I like it. And what can happen is we go, yeah, God sends people far, but He just sends some some people. Or maybe He doesn't send anyone. Or or then other people would be the other trip go, everyone is supposed to be a missionary. What the Bible shows us is that, yes, some will be sent far. Some will be sent as missionaries. Now, we see this in Jesus' followers, the Apostle Paul, the other disciples, the early traditions of the church as it just expands. But God still does that today. This is a picture of uh, Michael de la Rocha. Uh, Michael was a member of uh, the church I, I most recently served in California. And uh, Michael had actually had come to the church long before, or a couple years before I had been there. It was four or five years before I showed up. And he was, he was in rough shape. He was uh, a drug addict. He uh, was heavy into booze and uh, 
violent, I think he was kind of in and out of jail because of all of those things, like had a record, and just very, very rough for him. And his, his mom, as well as many people from the church, had just been praying for years for him, years. And he finally decided to accept an invitation to come to an Easter service. And at that Easter service, he gave his life to Christ. Got saved. And then, it took a lot of hunger, he got clean, and he got sober. Now, what I love about that story is it just shows us that when we're sent by God, we don't have to clean ourselves up first. Okay? So if some of you are like, I don't know if I really want to give my life to Jesus, I kind of want to keep him in arms like, because I still got some issues to work through. Guess what? We all got issues. I got plenty of issues, but we're not, we're not talking about my therapy session here. We all got issues. We all got things that we... We'd like to scrub away or clean up or things in our past that we'd like to put behind us. And then the story of Michael goes, no, Jesus comes to you just as you are. But he doesn't leave you the same way he found you. So he gets saved, he gets clean, and he starts doing all these odd jobs around the church. Just any job he can do. He started working with the youth, he worked in his custodian, he was doing everything. And he, in fact, uh, got um, uh, invited to do a short-term mission trip to Uganda. We were doing some work there. We did the bishop and um, uh, the pastor in the area. And he went. He just, just had this amazing experience. He was like, I want to do that again. So the next year, he went again. Had an amazing experience. He said, you know what? I, I think I might be being called to do this. I think I might be being sent far. And so he prayed about it. He saw wise counsel about it brothers and sisters in the church, and everyone gave the green light and said, no, you're, you're going to move there. You're going to be our, we, we were able to support him as our full-time missionary the entire time I was there. Um, and sure enough, he met uh, a beautiful, lovely, godly uh, Ugandan woman, and now they've got two boys and uh, twin girls. And uh, just the most amazing family, and right before I left, we were able to raise money to build him a house. Um, and that was necessary because you know, his, wife, his wife is Ugandan, so it was a Ugandan family, right? Which means it's, you know, mom and dad, kids, and like uncles and aunts galore, right? It's like a Hebrew Lutheran thing going on, right? You know, like, I'm related to them, they all live with me. You know, that's, that, that's kind of the picture. And one time I was asking, just like in this two bedroom apartment, like, how many people live with you? Like, how do you fit? Like, I don't understand. Um, it's like, we could use some space. Like, Let's build you a house. But he works there. Um, uh, he works at an organization called Smile Africa, and they care for uh, these um, uh, these kids who are of a tribe that is considered less than the other tribes. And so these are kids that just don't have any other resort. No one else is looking out for them. No one else is caring for them. And they feed them. They house many of them. They teach them. They love them. And they teach them about Jesus. God would send some druggy from L.A. to go change the lives of kids in Uganda is a testament that God will send us far. He will send us beyond our comfort zone. And maybe today is just our opportunity to be open to that. I think too often we go, nope, I'd never be sent too far. I'm coming up on retirement age. I can't be sent far. I'm in the middle of my life. I'm having a middle life crisis, but I can't be sent far. I'm, I'm, I'm coming, you know, into college or out of college. I can't be sent far. What if you just be open? That maybe that might be God's call. And at the very least, we can pray and support for those who are sent far. So we're sent far. Sometimes we're sent near. Right? Jesus himself is sent uh, often to nearby areas in the Gospels that were kind of undesirable. Right? They were the places that people would go out of their way to avoid. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you see him uh, talking with the Samaritan woman. Right? It's the Samaritan. Yeah, the Samaritan woman. Um, and she, you know, John 4. I mean, again, we don't quite get all the di cultural dynamics, but, like, Jews hated Samaritans. They hated them. Like, for centuries. And yet he goes right into Samaritan right to a well where she's sitting. She's got to check her past. She's got issues. She ends up starting to debate him about worship wars. He's, you know, she's like, oh, you think we should worship on that mountain? I think we should worship on that mountain. What say you? 
like debating it. And yet he just extends to her a living water that will never run dry. He steps into those places that we would rather avoid. Sometimes he sets us into places we'd rather avoid. And obviously things have you know, been difficult with COVID, but it kind of reminds me a little bit of the, the uh, Kairos prison ministry here. That, as you guys, and I know you guys like bake cookies for that, and many people have, have heard a lot about the cookies that have been baked. And I would remind you about tithing those cookies to your pastor. <laughs> Just say, less, you know, the, the Kairos ministry, 10%, this, no, no. It will be all right here. Um, but, uh, but man, that just shows us that God would send us into the places that we just would often overlook or often turn a blind eye to. That Jesus would step in, that we would step in and have compassion and mercy and grace. Um, and then sometimes he sends us here. And you ask, where is here? Wherever you are. Right? This kind of dovetails with the, my very first sermon to, every, to, to, to you all. That Wherever you are, you've been sent there. You've been placed there. You've been put there by God. And there aren't these kind of coincidences or just happenstance or just randomness. No. There's a reason that you're here. That perhaps for just such a time as this, Mordecai tells Esther that you have been raised up for the sake of the kingdom. Um, I think this changes things for us. And this is why I kind of I emphasize this in the first sermon, that's why I emphasize it again. It's because so often we reduce the Christian life to this really boring model of, well, I put my faith in Jesus, um, hopefully I do that a little bit younger when I'm in confirmation or something, and then I just lay low for the next couple decades, don't sin too much, not too much of that sinning, and then uh, be good enough to get that ticket punched to heaven. And that is a horrible view and a very unbiblical view of what it means to follow Jesus. And ultimately, it's a boring view to follow Jesus. But Jesus wants to let you know that other 167 hours a week that you're not sitting in church listening to stoops yelling at you in the name of Jesus, God is at work in those moments. God is at work in who is in your path. And God is at work in maybe who comes to mind. I mean, maybe you have that during the week. Someone who's kind of going about your business and someone comes to mind. Don't dismiss that. Reach out. Even just pray for them or send them a text or, or give them a call. Send a carrier pigeon. Whatever you have to do. It's not an accident. It's not random. You've been placed here for a reason. Um, I still didn't ask the person's permission. They were at the earlier service, but uh, so I won't use a name. But when I was interviewing here, um, I unfortunately was never given a steak dinner. I, I'm just letting, I, I let the call team know this. I'm like, everywhere else I got a steak dinner eventually, and I never got a steak dinner here. So I'm just, I'm just letting you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm holding the council. Um, or holding a, a, a grudge, perhaps. Um, maybe once COVID lifts, I'll get a big steak out of it. But I, I did get to go to Towsy House, which is obviously a very nice restaurant. And we're at Towsy House. And uh, one of the gentlemen there, um, where, uh, we had gotten to know the waitress, just at least her name and a little bit about her. And she had brought out our food after we ordered. And he, he leaned over to her and said, you know, hey, we're, we're Christians. We're going to pray uh, for, for our food now. But is there anything we can pray for, for you for about, about? And she says, now we don't know what her background is. We don't know if she's a Christian, if she's not a Christian, whether she's an atheist or agnostic or just disinterested. We, we have no idea. We just asked her, hey, can we, can we pray for you? And she says, actually, I'm buying a house right now. I'm kind of nervous about it all. We'll pray for that right now. And you can tell she was like almost beginning to kind of move away, but she just kind of stayed there with bowed her heads. I think I, I, think I was the one who prayed. And we just prayed for her over for the food, and then we prayed just for what she was going through, for the stress of buying a new house and all the inspections and all the things that have to go through. And I don't know what spiritual difference that made. But I do know God uses moments like that to carry people along one step at a time. Why would we not walk with him? Why would we not partner with him in those moments? Right? There, is, there is something pretty exhilarating about praying for a complete stranger 
or someone that you like literally only know their name and one thing that's going on, it's like, can I pray for you? It, it's weird the first time you do it. That's weird. It's always weird. Like, it's always slightly awkward. It's, that just is unavoidable. That's just going to happen. But if you get over that, if you step into that fear, oh, man, that's what God wants. That's what God shows up in power. I, I, I didn't tell this story earlier. I was, we had a preschool at Good Shepherd, and there was a, a, a Southeast Asian woman who had her kids in there, but she was just kind of walking, waiting for the kids to get out of school. And she walked past our, our sanctuary, we called it our worship center. And I happened to be walking through to take care of something. And, and I had that kind of moment where it was like, okay, I don't think she's seen me. I can, I can make my exit if I need to. Like, you know, I could just head on, not, you know, just, they look like, she looks like she's in thought or something. And I, I could just move on. But I didn't. I just turned, I, you know, went up to her and said, hey, you know, where, you have a kid in the preschool, and how are they doing? What age are they? We just talked for a little bit. And then she saw that we had a, a, our, our mission statement, a life-changing community of love on the wall. She said, love. That's, I like that. I'm not a Christian, but I like that idea of love. And so I was like, all right, I've been trained for this. I'm like, all right, you, you hand me the softball. I'm gonna, and so I, I open up to John 3.16. And I talked about what real, true love looks like for God. And she didn't become a Christian at that moment, but um, she didn't let me pray for her and pray over her. Um, and then that was, it's, those are the kind of moments that only happen when you step into the mess and step into the awkwardness and get over yourself. Because I definitely was not perfect in that whole interaction. Um, and neither will we. God's with us. He sent us to do that. So, where does he send us? He sent us far, near, and here. Now, how has he sent us? I think the bell's going to ring outside if I don't hurry up. So, he sent us, uh, he sent, was sent with a focus on grace. He was sent with a focus on grace. Right? And Jesus literally meets the mess and steps into it. Right? I mean, that's shown, that shown to us in the first Advent, right? He's, he's not given a royal welcome. He's, yes, yes, the shepherds kind of come, and there's some angels singing, and the three wise men will come a couple years later. But this is not what the king, the god of the universe, rightly deserves. We are messed up people. And yet he steps in to know us, and to love us, and to show his grace and his compassion on us. Quick story. Um, me not being I told that story where I, I, look, I look better than I am. Let me tell you the real story. A couple weeks ago, I was going uh, in between the services across here over to the park station. And my, um, my daughter was, had just this bad cold. And so, you know, you know when a, like a three and a half, four year old has a bad cold, it means like snot is everywhere. It's like, I chew, and you're just like, whoa, you like bring paper towels, and you're just like wrap them around her head. And, and so she's like coughing and sneezing, and I'm like, at that point, like, I gotta go back to the service, and I don't wanna get sick right now. And, uh, and then she's also watching TV, so she's squealing in these high pitched, you know, because she's excited. I don't know, all this thing is happening. And I, I literally just walked to the door. I see that, it's not everywhere. I then, like, look, my wife comes in, and I say, oh, hey, you know, how are you doing? You know, I, 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 I'm a good husband. I came between services to see you, you know? Um, and she's like, yeah, the dog just threw up. <laughs> Has he ever thrown up before? No. Has he ever thrown up since? No. But at that exact moment, he decided to throw up. And so, with all the grace and compassion I could muster, I turned around and I walked right out. <laughs> I, think I, I think I yelled over my shoulder, gotta go! Back to work. <laughs> a bad pastor. A bad Because that's our natural inclination. That's the temptation. Let's lean into the mess. Let's lean into the awkwardness. That's where God is moving. Jesus was also sent to focus on others. Right? Jesus doesn't pull in to, to his ministry and go, hey guys, it's all about me. No, he says, I, the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served, but to serve. Right? In John 3, 16, which I just talked about, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him could not, should not perish, but, he, but have eternal life. 
Back in earlier in John, John 15, 13, it says, for uh, no one has greater love than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus shows us again and again that part of being sent is not for us to be sent, to be all concerned about ourselves, about how we get ahead and how we get what we want, but man, we truly find life when we lay down our wants, desires, and dreams for the sake of others. And that's, that's what makes a difference in the church and in our families, and in our marriages. But it's not all about us. Because when we lose sight of this, it gets so easy to look inward, and for, for churches to just turn inward, become that holy huddle that never looks out, and gets more hung up on its opinions, and its preferences, and its wants, and its desires, and am I comfortable or not, and is this pew, you know, got enough cushion? You know, like, is that, is that, is that what it's all about? No. We've been called, and gifted, and blessed, sent for the sake of the world, the sake of our neighborhood, the sake of the nations. And then, finally, Jesus focused on the message. We have to use our words. I've never, ever in my life done a good deed and someone, you know, like hold the door for, for someone and have them, like, walk through and go, wait a second. Tell me about this, Jesus. No one ever does that. We have to use our words. We have to be able to just, and again, we don't have to have the perfect words. We don't have to use just the right words. We just have to simply be able to say, Jesus died for our sins so that we can have a new relationship with God by trusting and believing in him. The gospel, the good news. What words are we exactly going to say? We simply have to use our words. Now, I know that this all can seem overwhelming. Right? It can seem overwhelming, especially when you hear pastor stories of, oh, people just randomly walking up to me and want to talk about Jesus. I, I get that. But we have the greatest comfort in the world. If you are a follower of Jesus today, if your faith and trust is in him, you have the greatest reason to believe you're sent. And that's because you have the Holy Spirit within you. Look at the very end of the passage. This is where we'll land. Verse 22. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. The, the Greek word for breathed there is the same word that they used in the translation of the Old Testament into Greek for when God breathes into Adam. Right? This is a breath of new life, a breath of new creation. This is the power of God that dwells within those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus. And does that mean that we get it all right, that we're perfect all the time? No. But it does mean that we can step in to those moments where we feel fear. We can step into those moments where we're nervous. We can speak up when we're tempted to be kept silent. But that we can know that we have been sent far, near, and here so that we can actually not focus on ourselves, but rather focus on grace, on others, and on the message that Jesus has given us. Now look, as we live in this in-between time, as we're sent in this in-between time, I know it's weird to talk about evangelism and being sent when we're still kind of in lockdown. I know the lockdown eases a little bit tomorrow, but it's still really weird and awkward to talk about. But here's what I want. And, and part of the reason that we're, that, I'm, that we're preaching about this is because I believe as we move into this next season, as we move into this next chapter that God has for us, we need to get our minds around this perspective of being sent. And we're not just here by chance or by randomness. Because I don't want, when, when Lord willing, this all lifts, us to be caught flat-footed. I want us to be ready. I want us to be itching. I want us to know we're sent. That we can share the good news of Jesus and we can see his kingdom do some tremendous things in our midst. God is not done with us. God is sending us. So let's be ready. Let's prepare ourselves. Let's receive the Holy Spirit for what He is going to do in our lives. So would you please pray with me? <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have uh, made your business of using imperfect people of using just ordinary men and women for your extraordinary call and purpose and mission. Father, might we know that even though 
we're not going to, any of us is really going to be heading on a mission trip tomorrow. That tomorrow we'll be heading to work. We'll be joining school online. We'll be hanging out with friends or going to a, a grocery store. Or maybe his restaurant's open up going there. But wherever we are, Father, would you open our minds? Would you give us courage to step out in faith? To see you work your miraculous, life-giving power. Father, it's scary. And yet you have called us to walk out upon the waters, to trust you, that you will move. And it's all for your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as you're able? And so we share together this meal as a reminder that Jesus is still with us 2,000 years later, that he meets us in the mess, and that he nourishes us and empowers us to go forward. And so we remember on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's life, death, and resurrection until he comes. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we share communion together, I want you to know that you don't need to be a member of our church or our denomination. If you believe in Jesus and trust in him as your Lord and Savior, we want you to be a part of this meal. And so our ushers are going to uh, be, how do you this one? They're going to drop it, the prepackaged cup, into your cupped hands. So if you just put out your hands to receive that. And once you've received the cup, just hold on to it for a, a moment. You can prepare yourself with a prayer. And then we'll all take communion together. Blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for coming to meet us in this meeting. For allowing us to know your grace. May you fill us up with your Holy Spirit as you send us out this week. And we might be attentive to your voice and, um, and tender to your guidance. That's all for your beautiful name we pray. Amen. So I want to invite you guys to open your hands, to lift your faces, and to receive the blessing of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's worship. <laughs> 